This is White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Our vision is to provide a place for hurting, broken people to find love, forgiveness, and encouragement. A place to help develop people to spiritual maturity through Bible study, training courses, and small group ministries. A place to help every believer discover their God-given gifts, talents, and callings. It's our desire to strengthen families, and to be a blessing to all who come our way. And now, White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. scripture in Isaiah you read that the verse that was on there they that wait upon the Lord I was looking up in the dictionary you know wait is kind of a, kind of an unusual word for us because it's it's different in the English language if you translate the English to wait but you know the word actually means to hope to anticipate I mean to anticipate I mean anticipate the Lord showing up you know that word the when you come in here it says expect a miracle an expectation, an anticipation to trust. Get this now, it requires faith, patience, patience, how many need patience? Humility, meekness, long suffering, and above all, endurance. How many know you're waiting on something but you're not waiting to give up, you're waiting for it to receive it? That's what our life is about, that we're waiting to receive. Our glorified bodies. I mean, I need a glorified body today. I don't, you do too. We're waiting, and we're waiting in patient faith today. And I love this song. 
It says, wait on you. I don't believe in fairy tales. I guess I've outgrown them. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe that there's something bigger than me. Because I've seen in a hospital room when the doctor said sorry. There's nothing more we can do. Well, it wasn't through. I've never seen a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. But I've got a promise I can hold in the middle of the struggle. God, if you said it, I believe you'll perform it. May not be how I want you to, but here's what I'll do. I'm gonna wait on you. Come on. I'm gonna wait on you. Yes. I've tasted your goodness. I'm trusting your promise. I'm gonna wait on you. Oh, I'm gonna. Come on, everyone, let's sing this together. Come on, I know you've ordered every step. I know you've ordered every step. Yeah, you are the author. And there's no predicting what is next. But you hold the future. And all the questions, they come second to the one I know is true. I'm going to endure to the end. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to run this race with patience. I'm going to run it with meekness and humility. I'm going to trust not in me, but I'm going to trust in God and what he's doing. Come on. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord.
word says they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up upon a wings like an eagle and they'll soar they shall run and not get weary they shall walk and not faint that's what happens when you wait oh happens when you wait come on sing it out says to redeem the time for the days are growing short Lord we're going to redeem our time by doing what you've called us to do we're going to redeem our time Lord by Lord trusting you Lord we praise you Jesus we're going to worship you in spirit and in truth come on this is the time praise you Jesus hallelujah this is the time when true worshipers will worship you, these are the days. These are the days when my Father's ways will be known to me. This is the hour. Oh, this is the hour. Spirit's power will move again. Oh, hallelujah! As we worship Him in spirit and in truth, let's sing that again. This is the time, Lord, we worship You. This is the time. When true worshipers will worship you. These are the days when my Father's ways will be known to me. This is the hour. As we worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, we cry out, holy, holy, holy this morning. Oh, holy, we cry, come on. Oh, we cry, holy, come on. Oh,
It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. I'm going to stop there, and I want to title the message today, Jesus the Messiah. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of the Word. Thank you for the anointing of the Word. And Lord, you are the Word. And as your Word goes forward today, may it minister to every heart and every life of every individual who's made their way to the house of God today. Above all, if there's anyone here who's not prepared and ready to meet you, may they know you before they walk out of this place. It's our prayer today. Thank you for your glory, for your presence. And Lord, just minister in this place like no other you're the only one. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And everyone in agreement said, amen and amen. Jesus, the Messiah. The word Jesus means Savior. The word Jesus means salvation. The word Christ means Messiah. So it's Jesus, the Messiah. He's Savior, the Messiah. That's who he is. I want to read these scriptures to you from the NLT. So put your ears on. It says, long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. How many of you believe these are the final days? Amen. Amen. He has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels. Just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. He is Jesus. He is Savior. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Amen? And you know what? We need to know him, and not just in name only. Now, I got to admit to you, before I got saved, I'd heard the word Jesus, but I didn't really know who he was. I was raised not so much in a Christian home. I was raised in a backslider's home where, you know, we didn't go to church. I probably didn't go to church three or four times until I turned 18 years old. I didn't, we didn't go to church. But my mother and my father, they feared the Lord. Because they had once known the Lord, but got away from God. How many of you know that can happen to you? And my mother would talk about Jesus and, you know, okay, who is he? He he died on a cross. And that's about all I knew. But knowing Jesus, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know that he was Savior. I didn't know he was the Messiah. Matter of fact, I didn't even know what a Messiah was. And it's like so many people today. As a matter of fact, the writer here in the book of Hebrews, what he's doing, he is proving to Jewish Christians He's talking to Jewish Christians, and he's trying to prove to them just who Jesus is. This is what he's trying to do. See, they were provoked by other Jews to turn them back to the law. There were those others who were trying to convince them, you don't need to follow Jesus. You just need to go back under the law of Moses. That's what you need to do. So the writer of Hebrews, what he's trying to do, he's trying to provoke them into serving God and understanding and knowing the reality of who Jesus is. So what we're talking about this morning is just who Jesus is. He's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He is the divine revelation. Revelation of Almighty God. The word revelation means to reveal. How many of you know that Jesus revealed to you and me just who the Father is? He did. Look at our scripture text with us this morning. In verse 1, it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now notice verse 2. He hath in these last days spoken to unto us by his son. Now, let me stop right there. Did you know in Old Testament times, folks, men who needed to hear, the, hear a word from the Lord, they would go to a prophet. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us, and it's found in, in, uh, in John's gospel, chapter 17, or rather it's in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. Listen what the Lord said here. He says, before, in, before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, When he went to get a word from God, the word tells us, thus he spake, come and let us go see the seer, the seer, S-E-E-R. Let us go see the seer for he that is now called a prophet was before time, before he was called a prophet, he was called a seer. And you see men who wanted to get a word from God, they would come to a seer or a prophet. Jesus came into the world as the last of the seers. He really did. 
I mean, that's prophets speaking as divine oracle from God. In verse 2, what it's saying is, is whatever words Jesus said, the Father gave him. How many of you know Jesus spoke the words of the Father? Amen? You're talking about prophetic. You're talking about a seer. He was the last of those. When he spoke, he spoke directly to, to men and women the words of the Father that the Father gave him. So what are you saying, Brother Roger? I'm saying the person who has Jesus living on the inside... When Jesus is living on the inside, guess what? That person hears the voice of the prophet speaking in his and her spirit. How many of you know the voice of the prophet will speak to your spirit man? He will tell you what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it, where to go, where not to go, what to say, what not to say. That's what the Holy Spirit does through us. Come on. He speaks to us. We don't have to go hunt up a prophet to get a word from God. We have the prophet on the inside of us. That speaks to us, and also he speaks through us. Amen? See, Jesus said to the Father in John chapter 17 and verse 8, he says, For I have given unto them the words which you gave me. Did you hear that? Jesus said, Lord, Father, I have given unto them the words you gave me. And then he goes on to say here in this same verse, And they have received them. Oh, I just wish everybody would receive the words that Jesus gives us. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing if we did? But this is what he's saying about his followers. He says, I've given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. And notice this, and I have known surely that I came out of thee, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Amen? They believe that I came from you. They believe that you sent me, and they have received the words that you gave me to give to them. What are you saying? Jesus is the divine revelation of God. He reveals God to each and every one of us. He's also the divine heir. Look here in verse 2 of our scripture text. He says, He hath in these last days, last days, spoken unto us by his Son. Now listen to this. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Let me stop right there. God has appointed his Son Jesus the heir of all things. How many of you know what an heir is? Anybody here ever received an inheritance? Huh? Maybe through a loved one that went home to be with the Lord, through a friend, through a neighbor, they gave you an inheritance. Well, Jesus is, is the heir of everything. And the Bible tells us that we are also joint heirs with him. See, the possessions of the universe, folks, belongs to Jesus. Lee was telling them in the first service this morning how big this universe is. He's got all those statistics up here. Blows your mind when you think about this mighty universe that was created by almighty God. And when we look in the word of God, the possessions of the universe belong to Jesus. The decisions and the authority and the judgments belong to Jesus. Amen. Why? Because he is the heir of the throne. He is. And all who is, he is given to him, all of it is given to him by the father. The father has given everything to Jesus. And Jesus has made every Christian, you and me, joint heirs with him. Think about that. He has made you and me a joint heir. In other words, what are you saying, Brother Roger? I'm saying when everything that you own belongs to him, in return, everything that he owns belongs to you. Woo! How many rich folks here today? Come on. We are joint heirs with him, aren't we? We are. And this is what the word is talking about. In Romans 8, 17, he says, And if children, if you are children, if you're born again, then heirs. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We are join heirs with him. And notice what he says, if we suffer with him. Now, you know, there are a lot of people who teach and preach that just give your heart to the Lord. There's no suffering, Donald. You'll never suffer. Everything will be wonderful. You'll just be blessed coming in and blessed going out. You'll never have another problem. Isn't that wonderful if that was true? But that just isn't true. The Word says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. There are things that we go through in this life. And we've got to understand that. The Lord never said it was going to be easy. But he did say, my grace is sufficient. We've got to understand this is all the hell we're going to see. We've got heaven coming one day. And those who teach and preach that you never have a problem, give your heart to the Lord, you'll never have another sick day. That's a lie too. I've had guys that I know that teaches and preaches not just divine healing, but divine health. Now, that sounds wonderful. 
And if a person has attained that, I say, praise God. But everyone I know who preaches that at one time or another, they've had to go to the doctor and get some help. Amen? <laughs> now, you don't need to be lying about it. It's like the fellow said, you're sick. <laughs> no, I'm not sick. <laughs> I'm healed. Now, I understand life and death in the power of the tongue. Now, I knew we need to confess our healing. But it's also, we got to be honest, too. Jesus took stripes on his back for our healing. And by his stripes, we are and we're healed. And we've got to stand on that and speak it even when we don't feel well. But don't lie. Hello? Am I making any sense to anybody? So we're divine heirs. Jesus makes us the new heirs. He does. Just as the Father God shared all things with Israel in the Old Testament, he shared everything with them. Now he shares everything with Jesus. Amen? And Jesus died in our place on the cross, folks. He did this, and he redeems us unto himself, making Christians new heirs. We are new heirs. Galatians 4, 7, Paul said, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, Listen now, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're no more servants, but we're sons. Look at your neighbor and tell him this. You ain't looking at chopped liver. <laughs> Amen. In Romans 8, 32, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give Freely give us all things. How many of you know God wants to bless us? We are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. He wants to bless us right out of our socks. He does. And it, listen, it's not a sin to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. But we don't be seeking the blessing. We seek the blesser. Come on. And as we make him the Lord of our lives, doesn't say we will never have, never have another problem. But he'll take care of us, won't he? So Jesus is the divine heir. And we are joint heirs. Jesus is also the divine creator. Look at our scripture text. Look at verse 2 once again. He says, he hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now notice this, by whom he made the worlds. Did you get that? By whom he made the worlds. Jesus was with the father God when the worlds were created, when he created this mighty universe. He was with the Father God when this took place. We understand that and we see that in the Word of God. Uh, he was involved in the creation of man, Jesus was. Jesus Christ is to be revered as the Creator. What are you saying, Brother Roger? In Genesis 1, 26, the Father said this. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Did you get that? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, they were all there when God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. If you want to see God, look at your neighbor. Because we're all made in his image and after his likeness. Amen? How many of you know that the proof of a creator is anyone who can give sight to the blind? Anyone who can give life to a withered hand? Anyone who can raise a person from the dead. How many of you know that's a credentials for a creator? <laughs> Amen. When he can put a new eyeball in your eye socket. Come on. When he can say, stretch forth your hand, it automatically it's healed. When he can say, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes up out of the grave. How many of you know that's credentials for a creator? Amen. See, no other religious prophet could do this, but Jesus did it. Jesus did it. And, and the word tells us in John chapter 9, verse 11, that he healed a blind man. And when he healed the blind man, when asked how, the blind man said this. He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay. He anointed my eyes, and he said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. He says, I went, I washed, and I received sight. Amen. Who is he? I don't know. I was blind, but now I see all he did, he got some mud and he, he some dirt and he spit in it and he made some mud pies and he anointed my eyes and he told me to go wash and when I came out, I see. Amen. All I can tell you is I, was one blind, I once was blind, but now I can see. How many of you out there this morning can say, I once was blind, but now I see? Come on. Only Jesus can perform a miracle like that when he opens up our spiritual eyes and we see for the first time in our life who we really are and what we really need. My God, if that, if that doesn't do something for you, you're dead. Are you listening to me? He's the divine creator, isn't he? Jesus is also the divine expression 
of the Father. Look at verse 3 of our scripture text. He who being, notice this, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Whose person? God's person, the Father. See, the personality and the character of Jesus was just like his Father. The personality and the character of Jesus was just like his Father. He acted like the Father. What the Father did, he did. Amen? No one could ever, uh, no one could have ever revealed to mankind what the Father was like except for Jesus because he was the spitting image of his Father. He spoke the words of his Father. He did what his Father told him to do. Amen? Everything about him was just like his Father. Matter of fact, the word says in John chapter 15, verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, listen to what he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. He's talking about himself. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what Things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Did you get that? The Son can do nothing himself, but what he seeth the Father do. How many fathers in the house today? By, by the way, next week is Father's Day. So we're going to honor all the fathers next week. Now somebody say, hooray. Amen. How many of you fathers have ever told your children this? Don't do what I do. But do as I say do. Anybody ever done that? See, I grew up in a backslider's home. And my father, my sisters will tell you this, he didn't always do the right thing. Mom didn't either. But dad used to tell me when I'm sitting there watching him, he said, now son, don't do as I do. He said, do as I say do. And you know what little Roger did? I did a lot worse than what he did. Because I watched him, and I said, if my dad can do that, I can do that too. And it was a whole lot worse. That's why it behooves each and every one of us as parents to live a life before our kids so they see Jesus inside of us. Amen? Don't do what you're, don't speak one thing and live another. Amen. Now, that's good. Y'all are to take that home with you and share it with everybody you know. Amen? But we've got to understand that. We are the divine expression of God. Amen? So he answered, and he, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, the, these also doeth, doeth the Son likewise. So Jesus was the divine expression of his Father. I mean, if you want to know about the Father, you look at this. I mean, Philip asked this question to Jesus. And it's found in John chapter 14, verse 8 and 9. Philip said unto the Lord, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. This is what he said to Jesus. Show us the Father, and it sufficeth, sufficeth us. Verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest then thou show us the Father? See, he wanted to know what God the Father looked like and how he behaved. This is what Philip wanted to know. What does God the Father look like? How does, how does he behave? And Jesus said, see me, and you've seen the Father. You see the image, and you've seen the glory of the Father God. Now, he didn't say, I am the Father, but he says, I'm like my Father. There, there are those who teach oneness. They teach that God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, it's all one. It's all Jesus. It's called Jesus only. But listen to me. We believe in Trinity. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Three separate and distinct persons, yet they're one, folks. They're one when it comes to agreement and holiness and righteousness. We understand that. So Jesus says, when you've seen me, you see the image and the glory of the Father God. Because I'm just like my Father. I'm just like my Father. Amen. So Jesus is the divine expression of God. Look here at verse number 3. He's the divine word also. Verse 3 says of our scripture text, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, listen now, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Did you get that? Upholding all things by the word of his power. See, the word that spake the worlds into being, folks, was clothed in flesh and then appeared to mankind. Do you understand that? 
The word says in John 1, 14, it says, and the word was made flesh. Did you get that? Who is the word? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Listen now. And we beheld the glory, his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, folks, when he spoke, when Jesus spoke, men heard the voice of the Almighty. When he spoke, devils recognized his authority. When Jesus spoke. When he spoke, Lazarus walked right out of his grave, didn't he? When Jesus spoke, he spoke the word. And guess what? Everything began to transpire. Everything began to take place. I, I thought so many times, and I heard it over the years, when Jesus was at Lazarus' tomb, I think about this. You know what he said? You remember he told him, roll the stone away. Oh, Lord, by this time he stinks. He's been dead four days. Jesus said, roll the stone away. He prayed a prayer. And then what did Jesus do? He spoke. And what did he say? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Buddy, here he came. He came out of that tomb. He was wrapped in grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. How many of you know he went like this? Thank you, Jesus. How many of you believe he did that? How many of you believe he had a fit? I mean, my God, they couldn't catch him. He was running from one end to the other. He was all around the place. Come on. But here's the thing that jumps out to me. Jesus called him by name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And I heard this years ago and stuck with me. Did you know if Jesus would have just said, come forth? Every grave would have burst open. Come on. Great, 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 great grandma would have come out of her grave too. Are you listening to me? That would have been a general resurrection because he is the word. The Bible tells us that he is the word. In John 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word, folks. And Jesus is the divine word. He really is. He really is. Amen? Thank God. You remember the Roman centurion? You remember him? He had a servant that was sick of the palsy. And he was a Gentile man, the Bible tells us. This is found in Matthew chapter 8. Yet he recognized Jesus as the Messiah. He recognized Jesus as God in the flesh. This Gentile, this Roman centurion. And he spoke the, the divine word to perform a, a miraculous miracle on his servant. You remember when he, he told him about his servant and, 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 and he said, I'll go home with you. Jesus said that. And I love what the Roman centurion said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, he says, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. What faith, folks. Jesus is the word. He says, you don't have to come to, to lay hands on him. He said, you're the word. You just speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Guess what? He was healed. Jesus is the divine word, isn't he? This is what we see. Amen. Upholding all things by the word of his power. He's also, as we look in the scripture, he's the divine sacrifice. Look at verse 3 of our scripture text. Who being in the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Notice this. When he had by himself purged our sins. Oh, somebody ought to be hollering glory. By himself, he purged our sins. You know, in Old Testament... Sin had to be atoned for once a year by the high priest. How many of you are thankful we're not living under the Old Testament? How many of you would like to have to go and get a jet and fly all the way to Israel once a year? When you get there, buy you a sheep or a goat, take over to the priest and have him kill that in the blood as an atonement for your sins for the next year. How many of you like to do that? Somebody said, that sounds pretty interesting. I like you. You're crazy. Amen. So sin had to be atoned for once a year by the high priest. And that happened until, until Jesus came and conquered sin once and for all. He conquered sin. And he did it by the sacrifice of himself. He is the, the lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world for the sins of men and women. Amen. He did it on the cross. Only Jesus now can grant pardon to the sinner. He's the only one that can forgive sin. The only one. I know some of you have come out of Catholicism. And I know that you were brought up and you would go to the priest. 
and you would confess all of your sins to that man, and he would forgive you of your sins. Well, I'm here today to tell you there ain't no man that can forgive you of your sins. There's only one that can forgive you, and he's Jesus. Amen? He's the only one that can forgive us of our sins. No man can do this. In Hebrews 10, 12, it says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, Jesus, and he did it, the word says forever. Look at your neighbor and say forever. He sat down on the right hand of God. Amen? This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. <laughs> you know, Isaiah had a vision of God, of Jesus. And the father says this about his son over 800 years before Jesus was ever born. It's found in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 11. And the father God says this about his son. He says this, looking down through the portals of time. Listen to what he says. He said, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. In other words, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he shall be satisfied. And then it says, by his knowledge, or because of the experience that Jesus went through, by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many. This is what the Father is saying. And he's talking about his son, Jesus. He says, by his knowledge, by his, because of his experience, he shall, shall my righteous servant justify many. Or in other words, he will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. This is what the Father God is saying. For he shall bear their iniquities or all of their sins. He's looking down and he said, there's, a, there's one that is coming. Come on. He's the Lamb of God. And he's the only one that will be able to forgive man of his sins. Hallelujah. And he talked about this. The prophet sees God. Never being satisfied with all the offerings that man made. Those offerings did not satisfy God. The blood of bulls and goats and sheep and all that stuff did not satisfy God. But now Jesus, he offers himself at Calvary. And only this satisfies the living God. And listen, through Jesus today, our sins are forgiven. Yeah. Woo! So who is Jesus? He's the divine sacrifice, folks. That's who he is. He's also the divine high priest. Now look at this now. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Notice what it says, our scripture text, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, and we, when he had by himself purged our sins. Now listen what it says. He sat down on the right hand of God of the majesty on high. Where is Jesus? Huh? He's at the right hand of the majesty on high. We use the term, Jesus lives in my heart. Actually, his spirit lives in our heart, the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of us. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is the divine high priest, amen? See, this Jesus who lived among men, this Jesus, folks, has returned to his Father in heaven. You remember when he said, it's expedient unto you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. And now Jesus is in heaven and he represents his children as their high priest, he represents us as his high priest. And he's there to be an eternal reminder to the Father God that man's sins have been atoned for. Amen? This, this, thus the sinning saint. Anybody here ever committed a sin since you got saved? Anybody here ever sinned since you got saved? Let me see your hand. If you don't raise your hand, please come on up here and pray for me. Because we have all committed sin. Amen? We have all committed sin. So the Father God... What is happening here, he is atone, Jesus is atoning for the sins of man. Even the sinning saint is able to confess his sins to Jesus. How many of you know Satan is an accuser of the brethren? Come on. And how many of you know that when we sin, we don't wait till next week or next month or next year to confess it to Jesus? Let me ask this question. How many of you know when you sin? Huh? I think we all know when we blew it. Right? So what do we do? Right then, we go to the Lord, our great high priest, and we say, Lord, I blew it. I messed up big time. Lord, would you please forgive me of my sins? And Lord, help me not to let this same thing happen to me again. Hello? 
You understand what I'm saying? This is, this is what we see. The Word says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, He's not talking to the sinner there. He's talking to the church. He is. And you know, how many of you ever had an Achilles heel, an area in your life where the devil just the same old thing, time after time, right? Isn't it wonderful when we get victory in that area of our life? But you know what happens? Here's what happens. And I told him in the first service, you know, our body is like a house. I want you to just picture a house in your mind. And Satan is walking around the house, and he's trying to find an entry point into that house. Garney, I remember it was, in, it was in 2017 when you got sick and you were in the hospital down in Greensboro. And I came home and did not have a key to get in. I thought, oh, Lord, how am I going to get in this house? So you know what I did? I went to the door, couldn't get in. Went to the other door, couldn't get in. I went to this window and the next window and the next window. I went all the way around the house trying to find a way in. And I found a window that wasn't locked, Garney. And it was about this wide (laughs) and about this tall. So I put a ladder up to that window, and I raised it up. And if you'd have seen Fat Boy going through that window, (laughs) I can only imagine if my neighbors were looking, they saw two legs sticking up through out this window. But I finally got in. I got victory. Amen. Now, what are you saying, Brother Roger? I'm saying the devil may be using that same entry point time and time again. But when you lock that thing down and he can't get in anymore, well, the devil's gone and you'll never have another problem and everything will be wonderful. No. He'll start walking around that house, shaking every window, shaking every door, trying to find another entry point to get in. Are you listening to me? We've got to understand that. Amen? But Jesus is our divine high priest. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, Jesus is the advocate. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things are right unto you. And notice what he said, that you sin not. How many of you know that we may sin, but we don't practice sin anymore? Sin breaks the heart of God. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. As Christians, we may fail every now and then. We may mess up. We confess it. We repent. We take up our cross and go on. But we've got to understand that we're not to continue sin. Because he said, notice what he says here. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. But, and if any man sin, knowing that we're capable of failing God, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen? Just like the Roman, the Romans, they had what they called a paraclete. A paraclete. And that word paraclete means a mediator, an advocate, an intercessor. Actually, the Holy Spirit is our paraclete who comes and walks beside of us. He's with us, amen, every day of our life. But the Roman paraclete, he stood up on behalf of the, of the guilty client that he was representing. And he was pleading for mercy instead of justice. This is what he did. See, Jesus states before the Father God on behalf of the guilty and the sinning saint, those of us who mess up, and he stands there pleading for mercy, and this is granted, and you know why? It's because Jesus paid the sacrifice totally for our sins. And he just reminds the Lord. He reminds the Father, I paid for his sins. Roger blew it. He messed up, but he came to me, and he confessed, and he asked me to forgive him, and I have forgiven him, Lord. Woo! Isn't that an awesome thing? It's awesome. Jesus paid the sacrifice totally for sin. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, talking about Jesus, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He is a merciful and a faithful high priest. He's reconciling, reconcil- reconciliation for the sins of the people. Y'all know it around here. My favorite scriptures is Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Let us therefore hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But was at all points tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. Then he said, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is the divine high priest, folks. We see these in these scriptures, verses 1 through 3. He is the divine revelation. He's the divine heir. He's the creator. He's the expression, divine expression of God, the divine word, the divine sacrifice, the divine high priest. He's Jesus, Savior, salvation, Christ, Messiah. That's who Jesus is. He's compassionate towards us. And when he comes in, old things pass away and all things become new. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus when he comes in. See, a lot of people are just religious. But how many of you know when Christ comes in, how do you know you're really saved? It's the love that God puts in your heart for all people. I actually read something that inspired me this morning on CNN. Another miracle. But I read this, and I shared it in the first service, and I want to share it with you. There was a state trooper in North Carolina. Is Ben here today? Ben? He's not here. He's a North Carolina state trooper. But there was a state trooper in North Carolina who pulled this lady over for speeding. She was African American, and she had her father in the front seat, who had just, they had just come from Duke, had cancer treatment. And, and had her two children in the back. And when the state trooper, who was white, he walked up and he said, Ma'am, do you know how fast you were going? And her dad spoke up and he says, I just came from Duke. He said, I'm going through treatments and everything. He says, it's not her fault, it's mine. Don't, please, don't. It's, it's my fault, it's my fault. And said so the trooper, he walked back to the car and got in the car. And he was back there for a while. And... Uh, the daughter said to her father, what in the world's going on? What's taking him so long? So he comes up on the side where her father's sitting, and he asked, he said, uh, what kind of cancer? And he told him the kind of cancer he was going through and the treatments and everything. And the state trooper, now, how many of you know that a lot of African Americans have a little trouble when, you know, intimidated and all the rest by, and they have been in the past when they get pulled over, what's going to happen here? And said, when the trooper came around to her dad's side, rolled the window down, he said, um, may I have prayer with you? And the daughter looked and the father looked and he said, yeah, we believe in prayer. And that state trooper laid hands on that gentleman and started praying for him. Well, while they were praying, the daughter in the passenger seat took out her, her, her phone and took a picture of the trooper who was praying for this individual. And after it was all said and done, he said, I'm not going to give you a ticket. He said, I want to tell you, a few years ago, I went through the same kind of cancer that you're going through. And he said, the Lord healed me and brought me through. And he said, I just wanted to pray for you. And he said, God bless y'all, go on. And they went on. Well, a few weeks later, her dad went home to be with the Lord. And she got out her phone, was looking at those pictures and how it blessed her, uh, that event that took place. Well, she put this, I think, on Facebook or something, and next thing you know, 4,000 people had looked at it, and they, everybody was talking about it and what had happened. Come to find out that this police officer was a Christian who loved the Lord, as we said, got healed, and uh, she was talking about how it inspired her and gave her faith in humankind again, that people actually do care and love one another. And you know, I thought, that's what we need in this world. That's what we need today is people to love one another. They're like Jesus. How many of you know we have done terrible things to God? Every one of us. The way we lived before we got saved, the things that broke the heart of God. But did he throw us away? No, he let that love be shed abroad in our hearts and lives. He gave us love for all people groups. It, it, even he taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Man, that's what the world needs. That's the answer to all the problems is people falling in love with the Lord. <laughs> nations wouldn't be rising against nations. Putin wouldn't be trying to, to take Ukraine over there. Amen. They'd be having a prayer meeting together. Are you listening to me? This is who Jesus is. 
He's all of these things. He's more than just a story. He's a reality. And you know what I want to close with is, you know what? He's coming back. I said he's coming back. In Acts chapter 1, let me share this with you and we'll close today. In Acts chapter 1 verse 6, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Then he goes on, very familiar verse of Scripture, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and all Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. The next verse says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Guess what? He's coming back. Amen. Jesus, the Messiah, he's coming back. Just as he said, just as you've seen him go, he's coming back. He told him, I got to go so the Holy Ghost will come. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, who empowers us, who guides us, who teaches us. It's expedient unto you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. Jesus, the Messiah, he's coming back. Who is he? He's all of these things and much more. Amen. To some of you, it's just a story to you because you've never experienced him. You've never experienced his love that he sheds abroad in our hearts and lives. You never experience the peace that passes all understanding that he gives us. He's so much. He's all of these things to us. This is who he is. I'm glad I know him, not know of him. It's different than knowing him and knowing of him. Perhaps maybe there's some here today in this sanctuary, in the balcony, on the main floor. You don't know him, but you're not here by accident or mistake. You're here because you have a divine appointment today. To meet the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Those of you live, in, live streaming, if you don't know him, you have an appointment right now. All you need to do is cry out to him and ask for mercy and forgiveness and invite him to come into your heart. He'll change you from the inside out. He'll make a new creature out of you right there where you are. He loves you. He loves you. We love you. We're going to leave. We invite you to come and be with us. If you haven't come back to church, come on back. Get in church. Be ready when the Lord comes. If you need prayer, call that number at the bottom of the screen. We'll pray for you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next time. I want to ask every head to be bowed, every eye be closed, and nobody moving around. He's here right now. I wonder how many of you are here today would say, Pastor, I'm a lot like you were. I knew of him, but I really didn't know him. I did not have a relationship with him.